Hey everyone, Rob Hamilton. We got a small group, so we can have a fun little interactive session here. Uh, I'm just going to go through the high level leveraging mini scripts and how to kind of help you, if you're an application developer, think about how to make Bitcoin better programmable money. Before we go deep in the details, though, what is Bitcoin script? It's the language that Satoshi originally invented when he created Bitcoin. It's a stack based language, reverse fourth. Uh, reverse Polish notation, it's fourth, like fourth. Uh, the rules, it, it's, it's the underlying rules in that determine how can you actually spend a given UTXO. If you've ever paid a witness script hash, you know, nested uh, script hash, you take this Bitcoin script, you hash it, and you can actually encode it into an address, right? Uh, these instructions that actually choose how the script executes are called opcodes, operational codes. And uh, they use a lot of things you're probably familiar with. If you're a developer, op check sig, op check multi sig, op if, op else. There's a whole list of them. Uh, most of Bitcoin actually uses very few. Uh, we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, when a new transaction is broadcasted, every single node looks at every new transaction that comes across the band and independently executes and verifies the transaction. This is what it means to verify a transaction in Bitcoin, is you're actually going through the sequential steps and executing the script itself. So, a script is considered valid if it's a number greater than one and it doesn't hit any certain fail conditions. So if it's empty, fails, if it's zero, fails, uh, as well as if you have certain opcodes, um, usually the verify ones, op check sig verify, is like op check sig, but in the event uh, it fails to meet that condition, it will just kill the script, right? As a quick visual for those that haven't seen it before, this is from Learn Me a Bitcoin. You have two elements of a transaction. You have the script pub key, which is the actual script, and you have the script sig, which we often refer to as the signature. So as this starts from the beginning, uh, you have a transaction, uh, you present the signature and the key, and then what you do is you actually push that forward, op du duplicates the key, you then hash the duplicated key, you then compare it to the one that's embedded in the script, you use equal verify to make sure, hey, do they equal to each other, and then finally you run the check sig operation. This is what a pay to public key hash transaction does, and this is what every single transaction, single sig you've ever done in Bitcoin, if you use pay to witness script hash, or pay to public witness public key hash, that would be with segwit, uh, it's embedded in the, uh, in the witness, slightly different, same concept though. So what can go wrong? Everything. Everything can go wrong. Uh, Satoshi, when he originally uh, you know, went down this path, he had 256 opcodes, and you really have to treat this like a loaded gun if you're gonna, and it's not a toy, if you're actually gonna be messing around with custom Bitcoin script, because Bitcoin is programmable money, there are no refunds, and uh, if you poorly execute a script transaction, that is strictly on you, and there's no refunds or anyone to cry to in Bitcoin. So with 256 opcodes in Bitcoin, most of them uh, are not actually active today. The first thing is make sure you have a signature that's required. You could actually just embed arbitrary data on chain and not require a signature, and then anyone can see it in the mempool and actually try and steal and snipe it from you. Uh, there's a bunch of defunct opcodes, opver, opcat, opxor, opmulti. Does anyone know what opver means? Satoshi, one he put in there, it's op version. So it guarantees a hard fork whenever you use it. Because if I have one version of the client and you have a different version of the client, we will get a different script output. So that op code was instantly killed. But since Bitcoin, you cannot reverse, you cannot undo things, it kind of just sits there like a landmark. They're um, op cast concatenate, op XOR, you know, XOR in bits, multiply, division. Satoshi um, wiped a bunch of these shortly before he left the project for concerns on a security basis here. And, uh, there's, there's a lot of like weird corner cases and stuff. Some of the opcodes, if they exist in a script, it will kill the function, it'll kill your money and ability to spend it. Some of them, it's, if it's in a different branch, like an if-else branch and you don't even touch it, it can be there as long as you don't go down that execution branch, right? So another thing to be concerned about, time lock mismatches. So who knows, op CSV. Object sequence verify, right? Um, and that is a, uh, relative time lock that's used in the Lightning Network when you're doing a hash time lock contract to make sure um, you put a penalty if you're gonna close a channel that you can't immediately pull your money out, right? Uh, op check lock time verify, op CLTV, is an absolute time lock. You can have op sequence verify and op check, uh, uh, ch uh, check lock time verify and op sequence verify in the same script. So op check lock time verify is, I wanna say this money is spendable January 1st, 
2030, or at block height 2 million. But you can't combine, but this is the other part too, there's different, you need to not mix your clocks. So there's two ways you can keep time in Bitcoin. There is the block height, which we're all familiar with, and there is the actual timestamp. So the miners actually put timestamps into every new block that is minted. The consensus rules, there's two bearing conditions. There's BIP113, which is the mean time passed, which is you actually take the median time of the past 11 blocks. And the second rule is you can't be further than two hours ahead of what your node's local time is. So this roughly keeps a, a very tight lock step in making sure that blockchain is always making forward progress in time, and you're not actually able to do a time warp attack and spoof your timestamps. This is very important for the difficulty adjustment and the regulation of Bitcoin mining to make sure uh, everything's kind of kept to the cadence. It's interesting, the timestamp is the one exogenous factor outside of Bitcoin that exists. The timestamp is the only thing that, uh, that is an external reference to something that is not within Bitcoin, and this is the kind of anchor uh, that keeps the chain moving forward and making the difficulty adjustment work. But if you put a lock, a block height time lock, and a time, wall time, clock time, in the same transaction, uh, the stack interpreter will break and you will not be able to spend your money. So you will break your money if you do that. So next thing, malleability. Transaction malleability is something that uh, SegWit resolved for the sake of the Lightning Network for not having changing transaction IDs. It did not actually remove malleability though. So when uh, the witness, since you can't commit to your own signature, when you pull the witness out, you were able to get a standard transaction ID that was never gonna change email, which was very important for lightning channels and being able to have off state, uh, off chain state being managed. Uh, witnesses though can be malleated because they're actually not signed by the transaction. And this is not an issue for very straightforward, simple scripts like a two of three or a single sig, but if you're gonna do uh, more complicated spending branches, miners, before it's confirmed in a block, can actually alter the witness and go down different spending paths that you were not intending. And they're able to do this because the witness is not signed. Uh, this was actually the result, uh, this was uh, tangential and related to the only known bug that's been found in any script. Uh, minimal if, is a rule that when you have an op if statement, you uh, are only expecting like a zero or one on the other end of it. It is a policy rule pre taproot, but in taproot it's consensus. And initially the compiler rules, which we'll get to in a little bit, actually did not uh, record this. So you were able to actually malleate the transaction and you could have something that was like a two of three multi-sig that says, oh, it's a two of two multi-sig, but actually, you know, after let's call it, you know, six months, I can make it one of two. The problem is you can actually as the minor malleate and make that timestamp look spoofed and actually trick and be able to pull the money out. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, these are all things that Miniscript actually addresses and we'll get to in a second. So even if you were to make your own custom script, that's not enough to spend your money. You actually need to be able to have a custom redemption script unique to your spending conditions to actually pull that money out. So that's what we're kind of going back on this previous slide. If you were to look at it, uh, this, the script sig is actually a redemption script. The moment you get more complicated in your Bitcoin scripting logic though, it's necessary that you actually have a matching puzzle piece, so to speak, of the script sig to be able to execute it. And as you get arbitrarily larger and more complex, you need to be concerned about, okay, cool, it, did you actually construct it in a way you can spend the money? Did you construct it in a way that someone can actually execute an unintended spending condition? Can a miner go in and malleate the transactions? These are all things that you need to worry about if you're writing your own homebrew custom Bitcoin script. So how do we address all of these concerns in a safe and scalable way to move beyond single sig and legacy multi-sig, which I refer to as your two of three, your three of five, seven of 11, just an, a T of N, right? Miniscript. So very briefly, Miniscript was, I think, initially conceptualized back in 2018 with Andrew Polster and Peter Will. They, uh, as a, just a shout out to reference, um, Andrew Polster does a great two hour talk at the London BitDevs talking about script and Miniscript. I would recommend giving that a watch if you're interested. Uh, the whole point though is being able to t simplify the creation, analysis, and composition of Bitcoin script. So taking all of these ideas of all of these different ways that you can possibly construct Bitcoin script, but how can you treat them almost like Lego bricks in such a way that you would be able to safely and in a reproducible way be able to actually do these more complicated spending conditions. Uh, first, what's really great, it's verifiable. You can actually take visual representations of how you want to spend your money in all of your nested if-then statements and all these spending branches. You can visually verify it and you can throw it into the manuscript compiler and you can actually verify the other end you're gonna get compatible Bitcoin script. 
uh, additionally composable. So you can be a company that has a very elaborate, very, very complicated uh, set of spending conditions. You have time locks, you have contingency keys, you have key hierarchies. Uh, a key hierarchy is something uh, I refer to as when you have a two of three multi-sig, but one key must sign. Not all keys are equal, right? This is something you can do in Miniscript where you can say, I want to have a two of three, but my key is more important, which is really great for counterparty risk mitigation. Uh, you can have this really crazy spending condition though for one company, and that could just become a one of a two of three as one of the three conditions, and you can have multiple companies come together with their own spending conditions. And that composability is a really great way to actually have other policies interact with each other. So you can just think about any time you ever wanted to change something and say, oh, instead of that one key, I want that one key to be its own crazy set of spending conditions. Miniscript allows you to click it in like a Lego brick. Um, additionally, it's optimized. So the Miniscript compiler is actually hyper-efficient uh, in several ways of being able to make sure that you're sequencing your, tran uh, your witnesses and the transaction script itself in such a way that you're using as few bytes as possible, and which is a really great utility. Uh, it's been something that's been shown to actually be able to do better um, for the Liquid Federation. So this originally came out of Blockstream, so they were able to use the manuscript compiler to get more efficient transactions that way. Also for bolt three invoices, they were able to tinker around with like hash time locks in such a way that they were able to get more optimal things. And it's really impressive that something that takes hundreds of man hours of very gifted people working on really hard problems, that you can have simple primitives that are distilled down in this compiler and it's able to instantly optimize them. And it's able to optimize any arbitrary script. Um, so what are the three main kind of tools that you would kind of want to call if you're working with Miniscript? What are the ways that you can kind of help protect and keep your money? One, Bitcoin signatures. We all know and love those. That's how we all uh, work and use with the Bitcoin today. Hash locks. You actually can actually have a pre-image. You can actually have a, you can commit to a hash on chain and you'd be able to uh, use that as part of your ways of making sure only verified parties are able to spend money. Uh, just as a quick aside, I think this is a really interesting thing. A lot of talk around discrete log contract, which I think are great for many probabilistic different outcomes. But if you have a binary outcome, you could use a hash lock with many scripts, and you can actually do like sports, like sport betting on chain. You just have an oracle, you have your cash, hash A, hash B, who wins, loses, whatever. And it's a much more straightforward primitive than using adaptive signatures or discrete log contracts, where discrete log contracts are great for a multiplicity of many, many outcomes. So if it's a binary outcome, or it's very few outcomes, it's something that you can actually distill into a hash lock. And then finally, time locks, which we went through before, absolute and relative, this is the difference between once the money is deposited, you can't spend it for X amount of time versus at X time in the future, right? An absolute time. It's meet me in three hours versus meet me at noon tomorrow. One's an absolute unit in time, one's relative to the moment we're currently sitting in. And then finally, uh, again, uh, the time lock side, you can do block height and epoch timestamp, like wall clock time, but do not mix those because you will break your money. Miniscript intentionally does not let you do that. If you throw it into the compiler and you actually have an error, it will refuse to compile it to an output descriptor. So on the left-hand side here, uh, just to talk about, okay, we laid out Bitcoin script, we laid out the idea of what Miniscript's trying to accomplish, we have how to actually execute this. So a Miniscript policy, it's a very high level human readable language that's able to let you do Sounds like the next one's in a tornado. Uh, so with many script policies, it's a high level human readable format, right? To speak in close to plain English as possible. What do you want to do? So on the lower left hand side here, we actually have the BDK Playground, the Bitcoin Dev Kit team, rep in the shirt today. Um, our product, uh, Trident, is built on top of BDK. It natively uses all these tools out of the box. But the BDK Playground is really like, bringing back on that Lego brick idea before, how could you, if you wanted to arrange a couple things and click them together, how would you be able to access and kind of make these custom spending conditions? So on that left-hand side is a visual representation. In this case, it's a two of three multi-sig. And then uh, after a day, 144 blocks, you actually become a two, a, a two of two, and it's two totally unrelated keys. This is just something I quickly typed up as an arbitrary example. Uh, the white text along the top there, uh, the OR 10, uh, that's actually the Miniscript policy. And then the way I visualize this, I kind of did a little brief color coding here. It's an OR condition with two branches. It's either the two of three threshold or an AND condition where you must be older than 144 blocks and have this two of two condition being met. And uh, this allows you to quickly verify conceptually what are you trying to do before you throw it in the Miniscript compiler. And if you were to throw this in the Miniscript compiler, you parse the policy, optimize the script size, everything we talked about before. Uh, and it actually spits out a Bitcoin output descriptor. Output descriptors, uh, for those that are familiar, are a new way of encoding uh, all of the metadata necessary to retrieve a Bitcoin transaction. Actually, just having you know two of three, uh, you know two of three keys is not enough. You need to have 
all of the X pubs if you're doing a legacy multisig and you need to know the derivation paths. Uh, in this example, I just grabbed single public keys, uh, private keys, so pretty straightforward. Don't need the derivation paths because these are one-off addresses. But the idea is that you now have all the information to actually be able to plug this into a wallet that supports output descriptors and spend with it like BDK. Uh, just right here, the Minsk, M-I-N-S-E, Minsk, uh, is a really cool conceptual idea of this, of an even higher level language. Uh, and in this case, on, the, on screen, we have an example where it's a two of three, but then after three months, it becomes a one key backup. And you can actually see on the right hand side what that looks like as a mini script policy, what that looks like as a, uh, what it looks like a policy, a mini script output descriptor, Bitcoin script, and an address. So this is the entire stack from low to high level of the actual technical details of what you're going through here. Uh, just a little quick note, just going back here, the weight 10, the weight one, these are variables that the, you're saying that I'm more, I'm 10x more likely to go through this top branch, this bottom branch, and this is part of the logic that the compiler is informing and how does it arrange the sequence of the transaction for the output descriptor. Um, so then tools that are building on, like uh, Bitcoin Core uh, merged uh, Miniscript uh, spending and output descriptor support uh, a few months ago. It's gonna be in the next major release. Uh, Rust Miniscript uh, maintained by Andrew Kolstra, uh, which is then also uh, on top of that is built into the Bitcoin dev kit. And then a uh, new project coming out, Bitcoiner Labs, they actually have taken this and made it work in JavaScript. So Bitcoiner Labs, if you actually wanna, if you're a JavaScript dev as opposed to um, a Rust dev. Uh, BDK also has bindings in Kotlin, Swift, Python. So you actually can build on top of BDK if you wanna use this stuff under the hood in different languages. It's a really powerful tool. As I mentioned before, it's what we're building on. So those of you wanna actually, with the core building blocks of like using this. And then from there, we have the wallets. So Wizard Sardine, formerly known as the Revault team, they have a wallet called Liana, which actually works right now on mainnet. They uh, have been working on these for a few, well, I think for months, if not well over a year, two years now. Uh, Antoine Poisson has done a lot of great code contributions in core and uh, kind of pushing all these examples for it. Also working with the Ledger team. Ledger was the first hardware wallet to support Miniscript and it can do any arbitrary spending condition uh, that you can actually manifest. Uh, the My Citadel wallet is a new project. It actually also builds on top, uh, does RGB support as well. Um, my company, AnchorWatch, uh, we've been building on Manuscript. We have a Trident wallet that is kind of leveraging this. And if anyone after this wants to get an invite to the alpha, I'm more than happy to throw you an invite, do some live demos. Uh, Coinster is actually a brand new project someone told me about last night, which is really interesting. It's actually taking the BDK playground, which we also built upon for a visual representation. And they actually do uh, not over Noster coordination. So actually I can get your end pub and, I, and we can all exchange end pubs and you can do these arbitrary large contracts, throw them into a mini script policy, compile them into an output descriptor. And you can actually under the hood do these more complicated spending conditions, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then so for the signing devices that actually support this one, as I mentioned before, Ledger, they were the first out with this. I would recommend Nano S Plus or the Nano X if you're gonna use one of them. It can work on the Nano S, the, that whole thing, but uh, it very quickly hits memory capacity issues. Uh, Spectre DIY also fully supports Miniscript today. Um, next would be the Tap Signer because it is a blind signer. It's the only you presented a valid SIG hash, it will just sign whatever you give it. So that's been on our docket of things to do is actually just take these PSBTs that are doing these more advanced spending conditions and actually have the tap signer just consume the message and sign it. It can't validate anything as a blind signer, but it is on the list, it can do it. Uh, and then the cold card. So uh, Rodolfo, uh, disclosure, uh, invest in my company, but Rodolfo, I was talking with two weeks ago at Bitcoin Park and he's been mentioning on Twitter recently, they are going to be adding manuscript support very soon after they add Taproot, so it's imminently coming. They've been putting a lot of thought in the design around how to properly execute this, but it's coming very, very soon. And I think we've got a couple minutes left. Any questions? Yes? Uh, stupid question, Taproot support? Yeah, no, great. that's a great point. So uh, Taproot support, yes. Um, I believe there's some additional optimization work to be done for Taproot specifically. When this was all initially built, it was before Taproot became consensus. Very interesting point, just while you're reminding me of this. One, one of the few constraints of Miniscript within its design system is you cannot repeat a key. So, and the reason is, is because if you're using a key, you can take a signature for this branch over here, you can just, and if it's also on a, a separate branch, you could use that same signature over. Uh, that's, that's particularly true for pay-to-witness script hash. 
The way you get around this, um, you're actually able to, if you're using a hardware wallet, actually index to a different account number. So the same ledger can actually sign many, many, many different transactions, uh, many different branches on the same output descriptor. And for Taproot, which is really great, is that you only, when you present a signature, you commit to a tap leaf, so you don't have this issue anymore. Uh, so it does work with Taproot. I think the tap, mini tap script support is coming. Um, looking forward to talking with uh, Andrew Wimber in Miami in a couple weeks about more about what that roadmap looks like. But yes, it does work. I think there's a little more optimization to fully leverage tap scripts in such a way uh, that you can have each of these spending branches and conditions is just one tap script, which is even better for privacy because for today, um, with pay to witness script hash, you must present all of the spending conditions at once in the transaction, whereas for tap script, you only need to reveal the information on the spend branch you're executing on. Uh, and actually, I have a very quick, if I pull this up right here, uh, this was something I did earlier this month. Uh, this is a actual transaction I use using our wallet Trident, doing some crazy corner cases and test conditions. This is the witness. These are a bunch of signatures and actually arguments that are being passed through to execute at different parts of the spend condition. And this is what it looks like under the hood. This is a full Bitcoin smart contract and pay to witness script hash. All of this. But you don't have to worry about this. If you use Manuscript and you're using your output descriptor, the, the wallets natively actually handle and parse all this logic to present this. And Bitcoin Core also is able to do what's called finalize a partially signed Bitcoin transaction, where it'll actually take all the fragments of information and construct the witness in such a way that it can become a valid transaction that can get broadcasted to the network. So this is a really powerful force multiplier for anyone who's thinking about more involved custody solutions, anyone who's thinking about more interesting uh, ways of leveraging Bitcoin as programmable money. Miniscript extracts a lot of the foot guns away, so you're able to you know, think about the harder problems that you want to attack and solve. Any other questions? Yes. You said no repeated keys. Does that mean you can't do a two of two and then after some block time do a one of two with the same keys? You can. So the, the way that, and just to be clear, so the question was, uh, because we cannot repeat a single public key, is that an issue where uh, you want to have a two of two that becomes a one of two when you're using the same key? And that's actually not an issue. I know I just pulled up the question slide again, but to go back here, uh, when we're talking about individual public keys, like you can actually look down and you're pushing 33 bytes onto the stack and these are the individual public keys for wallets. But what you can do is you can have, you know, a ledger, like here's my ledger, and I can have the first spending condition be derivation path account zero. And then the other spend branch could be derivation path account one. And since it's encoded in the output descriptor, what change branch you're gonna be, what, what branch you're gonna be using for different spending conditions, the ledger will read it and understand, oh, I'm the same key for both of these branches, and they'll be able to sign no matter what. So you can have one key that actually has multiple branches where it signs because it's just using child accounts to be able to actually execute that. So not an issue at all. The My Citadel team is doing something different where they are tweaking public keys, which is interesting. It, I think it brings a question of interoperability with other wallets that then support that and signing devices that then support the tweaking of public keys. But um, something that does absolutely work unequivocally though to make that uh, address that concern is just using different child accounts. Awesome. Any other questions? Cool. Awesome. If you want to get a demo or you want to get a little more hands-on showing what I'm working on, please stop by. Uh, always happy to kind of talk and get feedback. Thanks.